Hey, what's good self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital and today we're coming at you with a midweek update in the world of cannabis. Now, before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos, but then there's plenty of content for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself with. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so that you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the industry, identify top companies that you keep seeing pop up, and take advantage whenever you feel ready if you wish to do so. But we're going to start with this news uh, from Michigan. So thanks, Todd, for sharing this. this. is Beacon on Michigan for U.S. Cannabis. The Michigan Cannabis Regulatory Agency reports legal sales reached a record $195 million in April, which is a 27% increase month over month and 27% increase year over year. And obviously, we can thank 420 for this big boost in sales because, from my understanding, um, they jumped up to $195 million in April from $153 million in March. So that's an increase of you know over roughly 42 million in sales thanks to 420. So we do love to see that out of Michigan. So you can pause to read Beacon's entire Michigan update if you'd like, but very happy to report this out of a state with an unlimited license structure. Therefore, it's very competitive as anyone with the capital can basically get a license from my understanding and open up a dispensary. And for that reason, we've seen the prices go down for consumers in the state. And for that reason, we haven't seen as much growth in total sales, um, but very happy to see this jump in April, which just means that many people have cash to spend and they wanna buy legal cannabis if the opportunity is given to them. And so on to this one from Marijuana Moment, as Colorado monthly cannabis sales rebound in March, but purchases still down from a year ago. And so as, as Colorado heads into its eighth year as the most mature market in the country after legalizing for adult use in 2014, cannabis sales in Colorado rebounded slightly to $162 million in March, according to the latest data from the Colorado Department of Revenue. And the sales total represents a climb of more than 11% from February, when more than $145 million of cannabis was sold in the state, while March's totals also also represent a more than 22% decline when compared to the sales figures from March 2021. And while that is the case, that does happen as a market matures, because over time, the more mature a market gets, the less growth they will end up seeing. But it's worth keeping in mind that we do always typically see a very big December, followed by a weaker January and February before bouncing back possibly in March or in April, and then heading into the summer where we do see sales climb up. And so, so far this calendar year, more than 458 million of cannabis uh, has been sold in Colorado, which is nearly 20% below the pace that the state set last year. But it's still very early, and we'll see what this summer brings us. And so there's more information here if you just want to pause to read, but happy to relay that sales are still very strong out of Colorado, and keep in mind this is also March. So we'll look out for the April sales, which I imagine with 420 will continue heading up in the right direction that we like to see. And so on to this one, thank you, Todd, for sharing. As Missouri cannabis monthly sales increased 20% in April, thanks to 420, but keep in mind Missouri is a medical-only market. And so obviously, if they legalize for adult use, they would likely see more than a 20% increase, but because Missouri is a medical only market, still a 20% jump in a medical only market is quite impressive given the holiday as well. And so 36.8 million of medical cannabis is the new monthly record. So good job, Missouri. And so with that, on to Cureleaf's uh, reporting their first quarter 2022 results. And so just to walk through the highlights at the top, first quarter 2022 revenue of 313 million, up 20% year over year. First quarter 2022 adjusted EBITDA or earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization of 73 million, up 16% year over year. While their first quarter 2022 cash flow from operations brought in 57.4 million or 18% of revenue. So it is good to see Cureleaf posting some positive cash flow from operations, despite their total revenue falling a little bit from Q4 to Q1, from 320 million down to 313. But I think we can attribute a few factors to this. Firstly, consumers do like to spend big in December. And so for that reason, in January and February, they're typically not spending as much. Well, secondly, we know Croptober is a real factor that these companies have to deal with, especially in Q4 and Q1. As in California, California, illegal growers grow as much cannabis as they can from the spring into the fall. Then in the fall, they harvest it, send that cannabis across the country and try to undercut these legal companies in Q4 and Q1. And so despite that factor, I think it's great to see relatively strong and steady sales, highlighting that the demand for legal cannabis is still there. And then thirdly, all of the projections made for 2022 sales would have included New Jersey coming online maybe nine months prior or six months prior. So again, had New Jersey launched much sooner or Connecticut or New Jersey, this would be a completely different story. So I think, again, this is very good to highlight that year over year, they managed to grow their sales 20% from 260 million to 313 million without New Jersey or any of these new markets coming online. 
So that's one of my main takeaways from this first highlight at the top. But so we'll go through, you can pause to read the first quarter operating highlights, and then you can pause to read the post first quarter operating highlights, what they've done from the end of March 31st until now. But so if we take a look at their revenue, I do like to look at the breakdown. And so from Q4 2021 to Q1 2022, their retail revenue stayed relatively the same. And so obviously stores are a main driver of sales for Cureleaf, while their wholesale revenue actually decreased um, from 93.7 million in Q4 2021 to 85.7 million. And so while Cureleaf actually had 11 more stores online in Q1 than in Q4, yet they brought in less revenue, I don't think that's a huge cause for concern because you just have to factor in which states they're trying to expand in early on and why they're doing that. Because for example, if you could expand more in Arizona and New Jersey, where states have just come online, you'd likely want to do that and you'd see more retail revenue growth. However, I know that Cureleaf's been expanding a lot in Florida. And while they're not seeing a whole lot of revenue growth there, it's a very competitive market that you want to expand in early on and get all your costs under control so that when that adult use flips, you can take advantage and then you see that growth. And for that reason, I think it's more appropriate to focus on the year over year changes as opposed to the small quarter over quarter changes as all of these MSOs are spending as much money as they can now in the best ways possible to set themselves up in the future. And if we look at their wholesale accounts, Q1 of 2021, Cure Relief got that up to 2,000 accounts. By Q4 2021, they had their most at 2,300 and now that's back down to 2,200 as of Q1. And so while I do not own shares of Cureleaf, I do think they will be a good investment like the other T1 MSOs if you have the patience to wait in time. However, just to share that my bet is on Cresco Labs to be the nation's wholesale leader in time. And so seeing the fact that they're losing some wholesale accounts and losing wholesale revenue makes me a little bit happy, just means that Cureleaf's getting a bit less market share. And that means Cresco Labs can be picking that up. But again, that's not a jab against Cureleaf. It simply just is what it is. If they're losing their wholesale revenue, they're going to have to step up the game in order to get that market share back. And if they're losing that market share, it means someone else is just picking it up. And so I wanted to bring you down to the gross profit on cannabis sales. If we look at Q1 2021, they spent 131.8 million to bring in 259.8 million in revenue. But if we look at from Q1 to Q4, they actually decreased their cost of goods sold, which if their revenue is staying flat, we want to see that happening. So while it's not, not by much, they got their cost of goods sold down to 158.2 million in Q1, down from 160.5 million. And so again, while their revenue is staying flat, we do want to at least see them cutting their costs, which means that they get to keep a little more gross profit left over. So a few more things that I did want to scroll down and show you as well. Uh, positive income from operations, apparently 43.7 million in Q1, which is up from 42.8 million in Q4. That is before other expenses and taxes. And I am curious what this other expense might be, but regardless, that leaves them with a net loss of 21.7 million for Q1, which is actually an improvement from Q4 2021, where they had a net loss of 30 million. And so just to bring you down to the balance sheet, as I've showed you all the other MSOs, so might as well be fair and show you Cureleaf as well. And as they are spending big, much like Green Thumb and much like Verano in order to be the biggest in time, that comes with some intangible assets and some goodwill. But again, if you buy assets in good locations where they can drive revenue growth, you won't have to write off as much of this in the future if the assets that you bought actually produce the revenue that you thought they would. And so while their intangible assets are at 1.1 billion and their goodwill is at 665 million, obviously it seems like a lot, but CureLeafs is the biggest. And so obviously as they're aiming large, you know, they will hope that we, we as investors will hope that the investments that they made will provide the return on investment that they've sort of promised us. But just to show you something that I do want to, uh, just to show you something worth noting is that their cash on hand is 242 million while their total current assets right now. And I think a big part of that is inventory, 433 million worth of inventory. So that's cannabis that they can sell gives them total current assets of 977 million, almost a billion in total current assets as most of this is inventory that they want to sell. And I imagine since New Jersey has been unlocked, they're happy to unload this now. But just to compare that with their total current uh, liabilities, 436.8 million. And most of that is income tax payable, 182.9. And so in my view, at least it's good to see that Cureleaf does have breathing room for the next 12 months as their current cash could position could pay off the income tax payable. And if we combine their cash with, let's say, New Jersey sales for the rest of the year, they should have enough current assets in order to pay off their current liabilities, allowing them to continue to do what they do. And so that's it for my quick walkthrough and everything I found interesting worth sharing. But all in all, I think it was a pretty strong quarter from Cureleaf, despite the factors of Croptober, less spending and the fact that New Jersey didn't launch. Therefore, we did not see the revenue growth we're anticipating. But all that means is that since New Jersey has launched, any of the revenue growth we thought we might see in Q1 is likely going to come in Q2, Q3, and down the line. And as more states reform their laws and, you know, Connecticut launches, New York launches, we will see the total addressable market expand and that will benefit all the MSOs that have this footprint established. And so I wanted to share Seishu's a deeper dive for any of those that want or a deeper dive as he has a better background in finance than I do. And so while I just share some of the things that I look for, Seishu does go deep into the numbers with the margins, EBITDA and all that stuff. And so if you wanted to take a look at this, you can pause to read one, two, and three. Back to the numbers, you can pause to read four, five, six, seven, and eight. 
And then you can pause to read snippets 9, 10, Illinois, Florida, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Pause to read, and then pause to read 10, 11, 12, down to the end here. Otherwise, you can grab the link below if you want to check it out, or if you just want to follow Seishu, because obviously he does these for all the MSOs. And if you follow him on Twitter, you can get easy access to all of his, his takeaways when he posts them. And so on to this one from Todd Harrison. Also figured I'd show you what Camilo of BTIG had to say about Cureleaf as well. And so just going to share this one here. Oh, that's too much, actually, and too small. So... I'll share this snippet here. You can pause to read from down to 250 million revenue run rate. And then you can also pause to read this snippet. Now it's a little bit blurry here, but uh, otherwise you can grab the link below if you want to retrieve that. Well, on to some other MSOs. Air Wellness is expected to hold their first quarter 2022 conference call on May 26th, uh, 2022 at 8.30 a.m. And so uh, I know that Trulieve, I believe, is actually releasing their earnings tomorrow. Uh, a few other MSOs, I don't have them off memory uh, just because I've been working, so it's a little bit, I have less time to focus on this, unfortunately. So I do hope the videos are still up to good quality, but nonetheless, we'll see Air Wellness releasing their earnings on May 26th. So looking forward to see how all these MSOs have fared through these difficult times. While we did have some news, uh, some headlines about Schumer talking at a cannabis parade in New York City. And so while I don't think much of this because talk is cheap and Schumer has proven that to us, just going to share the headlines as this is good awareness for the cannabis industry. Senator Chuck Schumer attends New York City cannabis parade, legalize cannabis from one end of America to the other. Yeah, well, get out of the way, Schumer, and just deschedule the damn plant already. And so on to this one from Marijuana Moment. Schumer also says he's discussed cannabis bill with six Republicans in a speech at a New York City legalization rally. That's pretty pathetic if that's the case because you could have talked to a lot more since he took over as Senate Majority Leader until now because he's done nothing but talk out of his ass. And so we've got another Another quote straight from the butthole. I have invited every U.S. Senator, every Democrat, every Republican to come meet with us and tell us why they won't support the bill or whether they will. And I'm making good progress, Schumer said. And so obviously we know CAOA is dead on arrival, so I'm not sure what he's talking about. And if you've invited every Republican and you've only spoken with six, it doesn't seem like you're very popular to them. And so lastly, just to add, I've already met with six Republicans so we can get 10. Uh, Schumer, Six is not 10, you'll need four more. So keep working on that. And we can get the 60 votes we need on the floor of the Senate to pass legislation that is so important. And so I think we know at this point, the most important legislation is getting the Safe Banking Act passed because it will actually help the people that Schumer campaigned and said that he would actually work for and the people that voted for Schumer. So hopefully he can get this done in time. And so I'm very tired of just sharing talk and I wanna share some actual actions out of this guy. Hopefully he has some tricks up his sleeve to get something done uh, and maybe pass Safe Plus or maybe get something done with the 60 votes, who knows? but until then I keep saving in hopes that I will be able to continue to accumulate at these unbelievably cheap prices in the next few months. And so onto this one from Tom Engel is the U.S. government now considers basketball player Brittany Griner arrested in Russia for allegedly possessing cannabis vapes to be wrongfully detained even as Americans remain behind bars for cannabis at home and Biden's campaign pledges go unfulfilled. So hypocrisy at its finest as a lot of talk with little action to back it up but more importantly hopefully this could be some sort of foreshadowing of what's to come maybe some sort of resolution to get Brittany Griner released also releasing non-violent offenders from jail as many do still remain in jail in the U.S. At the same time, maybe descheduling cannabis as if the U.S. would do that first, that would lead to a total global domino effect. And so I wanted to share this one from Marijuana Moment as well, as apparently feds are funding research on role of cannabis in treating cancer, which sounds great. We'd like to just see them deschedule the cannabis plant which I think is the best way to reduce the double standard. But nonetheless, we see them doing what they need to do to start studying while keeping cannabis to Schedule 1, where it does not belong. Hopefully, we'll get some sort of Supreme Court ruling where they actually have to you know, deem that unconstitutional as well. We don't know. But in time, I'm just happy to report that we are getting more positive news towards cannabis. As the NIH's National Cancer Institute said, that the purpose of the solicitation is to promote research and understanding the mechanisms by which cannabis and cannabinoids affect cancer biology, cancer interception, cancer treatment, and resistance and management of cancer symptoms. And we know that the U.S. government has patents for cannabis, cannabinoids as medicine, so they're well aware of what it can do. So just to add, NIH said that the current body of epidemiological studies on this topic has yielded limited and inconsistent results. Yeah, okay. For example, while cannabis smoke may contain harmful constituents, it hasn't been directly linked to an increased risk of lung cancer, the notice says. Again, more reason to just deschedule the study. But they're getting to that, I guess. The agency said studies of other cancer types have shown no or inconsistent association with cannabis use, but these data are limited. While the compounds in cannabis affect the endocannabinoid system, which plays a role in modulating many cancer-relevant processes, such as cell proliferation, 
mortality, I believe, that like or motility, I don't know what that word is. I think it's probably mortality and survival, the notice says. And so uh, here's a list of the research topics that the NIH is seeking studies on with various funding opportunities. And so you can pause to read that whole list there. But I guess, you know, a little progress in the research field is better than none at all. But I think all we would want is just to see it descheduled so that they stop playing us and actually do what the people want, because that's sort of the role of government. They work for us. We don't work for them, right? So lastly, I wanted to share this one from Politico. As cannabis confusion, thousands of truckers taken off the job amid supply chain woes as drivers who are off duty or even on vacation for a week can't enjoy cannabis in a legal state. One Alabama trucking company complained to the Department of Transportation, most likely, and that is because cannabis can stay in your system for up to weeks or months even, even from just a few times. And that's just how the plant works. It's strange, but obviously, if you just deschedule the plant, all of these issues go away and you don't have any trucker woes or supply chain woes, and you'll have truckers being able to work as they should be able to work without the double standard and discrimination that we see, you know, being applied to people for cannabis. And so in other news, uh, Todd Harrison sharing this from Jeffries on cannabis. So further safe developments. I don't think there's a whole lot that I haven't shared from last week, but this likely summarizes all of the updates from last week. So you can pause to read further safe developments up until the Hill article, he thinks more GOP. So I think this is just summarizing what, um, what Schumer has said as well. So you can pause to read this bottom snippet. And then you can pause to read the, the top snippet as well. And so thanks, Todd, for sharing this. And that's Jeffries on U.S. Cannabis. And again, this is not advice, speculation from investment firms. Well, we've got some state news. As, so thank you, Todd, for sharing. Austin, Texas voters approved local cannabis decriminalization ballot initiative. The first step in a big state of Texas, which has a population of roughly 30 million, 29 million, but the measure passed by margin of 85% and 15%. Uh, 85% for, 15% against. So what this tells us is that the views towards cannabis are changing in Texas, and we don't know when legalization could happen in that state, but good to see progress being made and people shifting to uh, uh, better, more realistic views towards this plant. Well, we see out of Missouri, as we reported that Missouri had a very successful uh, April month with medical sales, thanks to 420. Good news is that Missouri activists submit double the signatures needed for cannabis legalization ballot initiative. As we submit more than 385,000 petition signatures, it's past time to end the senseless and costly prohibition of cannabis. And so this is a good effort to see Missouri trying to get uh, cannabis on the ballot for 2022. And I imagine citizens of Missouri will vote an overwhelming yes. And so another one from Todd Harrison. Thank you, Todd, for sharing this one. Uh, as Nebraska activists unveil a plan to put medical cannabis on the ballot after losing key funders, where there is a will, there is a way to get this done. So good luck, Nebraska activists. Hopefully you can get this done and put that on the 2022 ballot as well. We got some news out of South America as Argentina's Chamber of Deputies approves a medical cannabis and industrial hemp law. 155 votes in favor, 56 against, and 19 abstentions. So congratulations, Argentina, and hopefully you can get this medical program launched sooner than later, especially for your citizens. But this brings me to remember Mexico. Hey, where are you at? Wasn't Mexico supposed to legalize cannabis a long time ago? And we haven't heard anything. So I don't know what is going on there, but just goes to show that you cannot trust big bureaucracies to do what they say, even though they're supposed to work for the people. And again, we don't work for them. And so with that, though, just wanted to share this other update from Todd that apparently legal purchase and consumption should be possible in 2023 in Germany. And so the project is now gaining momentum, and I'll continue to provide updates of this good news as we get it and as it comes through. Well, I wanted to share this one from Puff Daddy. This is just another example of how cannabis is medicine and why we just need to start taking this seriously. And I know many people do, and obviously descheduling that is likely the first step to removing that double standard and make, you know, making people view it as something that's a legal plant and substance as opposed to an illegal one. But just to highlight, my pain levels have completely dropped. How medical cannabis changed my life. This article from The Guardian, as Andrea Wright diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis and fi fibromyalgia is now having a proper night's sleep thanks to cannabis. So you can grab the link below if you want to read the whole story, but just another example of why this is medicine. It ought to be taken seriously for what it is. Lastly, a few resources for you. We've got this one, another podcast from the Dales Report, another great informative one with Brady Cobb, another DC lobbyist who's been at the game or been in the game since 2014. And he does remind us that the business fundamentals remain strong. And so I do recommend tuning into this podcast as it's very informative, but I just want to share this snippet as he talks about finally getting through to Booker and Schumer's team that they understand that safe is needed. And so we'll just play this clip for you guys. What was the takeaway? Like what you guys discussed? There's a ton of mutual respect and there's a, everybody on that panel, social equity to them is to give me a free license and give me free money. Yeah. For them it's put us on the playing field, on the same playing field as everybody right. else and let us compete. Yeah. Okay. And you can't do that without a bank account. Everybody in that room supports a safe bank account. Schumer, come on. I just did a, I just did a spaces with Weldon. Weldon was very clear. I support the State Banking Act. Yeah. Because you're not going to be able to get money in bank accounts to support social equity licensees entering the space right. if they can't have non-predatory capital debt and they don't have the ability to open a bank account. Mm -hmm. 
if, if public companies, public GTI, CureLeaf, TrueLeaf, Verano, they all have bank accounts. Oh yeah, they're good. Yeah. The it's the the impact is being most felt on the smaller operators, the single state operators, the single dispensary owners who can't get bank accounts. The ones right. Schumer is quite so a you pool. See that changing that. Sadly. Well, I think we right. finally have educated Schumer and Booker on. Their best intentions are actually hurting the people they're trying to help. Right. Correct, which is what Booker and Schumer were getting traction on for the past, what, three months? Yeah. Four months? They're tr- the that. people they're trying to help are the ones that they're actually hurting by blocking state bank. Yeah. Right, and I've said that many times, but happy to hear that out of Brady's, Brady's mouth because it is what it is. Like, regardless of what their narrative is and how they want to appeal to their dem base, it is what it is. So the sooner that they can get safe pass, the sooner they help the people that actually voted for them and the better they increase their odds of getting voted back in in 2022. So one more video. Uh, this one comes from Daniel Pronk, who's a great financial YouTuber. Uh, and he, this was a cannabis-focused one because he goes, we need to talk. This is getting insane. So I imagine he's getting a lot of comments from people saying, hey, Daniel, I know you've got a big position in TrueLeave. And he started buying in TrueLeave in February highs of 2021 as well. I know he's down a lot, just as much as I'm down in my positions, but I know he's been accumulating much like I have. But just to highlight, you can go through this and he sort of makes this video to say to his, his uh, subscribers, like, look, I'm in invested in cannabis. I'm not going anywhere. This industry is going to be huge. And so if you want to just get someone else's view on this industry, like comparative to mine, I'd recommend tuning in to watch this. Um, but he even admits in there that he's like, I'm still going to be continuing to buy TrueLeaf because he thinks they're the best bang for his buck. He's bullish on this industry. And so while this is getting insane, again, I think the best thing you can do is just keep saving up and accumulating because that is my plan. Again, that's not advice, but that's what I plan to do because I know these are real businesses. I know they're not going anywhere. I just know that one day the flip is going to switch and I'm going to be very happy that I accumulated while I could. And so lastly, Wanted to share this nice visual from CC Visuals. I think he's getting back into the visual game and uh, love to see that because he does make some really good ones. Top five MSOs comp sheet. So some highlights, Cureleaf, Green Thumb Industries, uh, Trueleaf, Verano, and Cresco Labs. And so you can pause to get this. Otherwise, the link is down below. Um, and he walks through the mar- shares outstanding, market cap, debt, cash plus cash equivalents, their enterprise value plus full year 2021 revenue, and then 2022 and 2023 estimates. And obviously those estimates likely include Connecticut coming online by the end of the end of the year, New York coming online by the end of the year, New Jersey, hopefully, you know, expanding to more dispensaries than just 13, but also think of Illinois, like the fact that they've only had, I think 85 or something dispensaries, I forget exactly how much, but they have another 185 equity licenses that have been awarded, but they can't be approved due to litigation. And while it's very annoying, the moment that flips switch, that is going to be very helpful in Illinois. So obviously these are the best case revenue estimates that might not pan out, but just to, wanted to give you that context so that you know, while trailing 12 month cash from ops, trailing 12 month capital expenditures, free cash flow, gross margins, EBITDA margins, deferred tax liability. I'm not exactly sure how this applies, but just sharing it because it's on here and valuation multiples looking at 2021, 2022 and 2023 enterprise value divided by sales. And lastly, at the bottom, trailing 12 months enterprise value divided by operating cash flow. And that is it for today's episode, folks. So I hope you got some value out of it. And I want to thank you so much for tuning in. What did you think of the stories mentioned? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions, and I'd be happy to address them. But besides that, if you enjoyed this video and you learned something, please leave a like on it. Subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos. And I will catch you on Sunday for this week in cannabis news. Have a great week, everybody.